Uh, welcome to Zcast, everybody. I'm Zias Caraval from ZK Research, and I'm here with my co-host, Chris Primesberger. Uh, Chris, uh, we took a couple weeks off on the 4th of July. I hope you had a good 4th. Yeah, we did. How about you? We didn't have any fireworks in our town, at least any legal fireworks. There were a lot of <laughs> illegal fireworks. Yeah, but, I think that's always the case. I think you always get a lot of illegal fireworks. So Yeah, um, we, we, we took our bikes around our neighborhood, and we stopped and just watched the, the illegal fireworks right over our heads. <laughs> Oh, well, that's always that's always a fun thing to do. Uh, before we get into the topics today, I just do want to give a shout out to eWeek, uh, my media partner, and the Zcaster done in conjunction with their eSpeaks program. Uh, yeah, Chris is, um, you know, I guess it's part of the 4th of July. It's not really the 4th of July, but uh, uh, over the past weekend, they did actually go to the MLB All-Star Game, which is, you know, hence you see the shirt, um, which I guess you could think was an extended uh, part of that weekend. And I must say, part of the reason I went, obviously, is because I'm a baseball fan. Check out the Red Sox hat in the background. We had no less than five uh, All-Stars. Uh, but also, it was the first post-pandemic All-Star game. And I've been tracking uh, the use of technology in sports. I do a lot of work with, you know, Extreme Networks, who actually uh, helped set me up a couple of interviews there uh, to talk about the – in fact, they're the official Wi-Fi partner now of Major League Baseball. And uh, it was pretty fascinating, the changes – uh, two sporting events in Major League Baseball in particular. First of all, the biggest change is just the use of digital tickets. Um, MLB has its own application now um, in which that's the only way you can get tickets. So this problem that, you, that leagues had before with uh, the after sale market and scalpers and stuff like that goes away. In fact, with a digital ticket, if I even took a picture of it and sent it to you, it wouldn't work. It's got this constantly changing QR code. And um, so that does help um, you know, the scalpers who control people who come in and out. And so hopefully people aren't going to get, you always hear stories of people, the deals that are too good to be true. I know people actually that bought front row seats at a concert for like 50 bucks each. They thought it was a great deal and they were fake tickets, right? So uh, that kind of thing goes away. Um, I met with um, a, a person there. Uh, and again, thanks to Extreme for setting me up with this interview with Crew and Boys, who's the SPVP of infrastructure for Major League, Major League Baseball. And we talked extensively about the role of the network in the in, in the the fan experience and in digital baseball itself, and uh, uh, they're um, it's pretty interesting that um, the they're tracking everything now from people who come in, what social apps they're using. They haven't figured out what they're going to do with that data, but clearly they're going to do something uh, within the park. Uh, they know the location of every baseball, the speed it goes, the exit velocity, and the amount of data that they show is unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, in fact, it would, during the home run derby, every baseball hit uh, out of the park, you would see all this data coming up on it. And even throughout the, 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 the whole experience, you, you saw this constant uh, a flow of data coming up. And uh, he did tell me that they're experimenting with automated balls and strikes and things like that. So I think as a, as a fan, you're going to see a greatly improved experience because of the role of, of the network. And um, because of that, you're starting to see more and more parks upgrading uh, it there. And, and you know, clearly um, with, with a combination of Wi-Fi 6 and 5G, uh, there's more and more bandwidth uh, than ever before. In fact, I think he told me that there's 20 gigs of bandwidth coming in and out of every park. And so, you know, between that and the video feeds, people want to watch replays and, you know, in real time, just the overall experience of going to a baseball game has, you know, has changed quite a bit. So, I don't know if you, you know have any thoughts this, on that. You know, yeah, you know what this means, Zias, is that everything in the world is data. Think about it. Every yeah. time you, you take a step, you know, it's counted. Um, you blink your eyes. Well, maybe not blinking our eyes yet, but it will get that way. Data uh, is everywhere. Baseball, Major League Baseball is, is showing us in its own way the way data drives that sport. You know, it used to be just balls and strikes. You know, it used to be just um, batting averages and, and, uh, and, you know, earned run averages. No, no more. Yeah. Like you said, it's exit speeds. It's, you know, it's so many yeah, it's, different it's, categories. It's exit speed. It's spin rate for pitchers. You know, it's, um, it, it's literally everything. And, the, and the, you know, the, when you watch it on TV, the stat cast, in fact, the, uh, yeah, uh, boys told me something pretty interesting that in every park, they use Google. Uh, Google's actually one of their StatCast sponsors. So the, all the data that you see coming up on the screen, screen, screen comes from the Google Cloud. They actually have a replicated 
Google Cloud in every park. Um, and that's so a lot of the data that they want to push live and get calculations right away. They, you know, going to the cloud and back is too slow. So they have to do that in park. And so, you, you know, a lot of people think of baseball as being a bit of an antiquated kind of stodgy old sport and stuff, but they have the, 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 the modernization of it over the past couple of years has been unbelievable. And it's interesting that, you know, COVID was the catalyst for this, Chris, where a lot of bad came out of it. But frankly, we hear all the time about stories of companies having to accelerate their digital transformation efforts. And I don't know if baseball would be where it is today had it not been for the need, you know, created from the pandemic. And so it creates a safer environment for everybody, even from the point where they don't accept cash at the, at the, at the cash register anymore. Everything's, you know, cashless now. So, you know, that's actually better for, you know, less, less chance of theft and you don't have to carry money and things like that. So the overall experience, I think, is, is greatly improved. And we can think, you know, like I said, thank the network for that. Yeah, and you know, just to put a, a capper on it, you know, all these statistics, these new statistics and new records are being compiled, and they, you know, what they result in is uh, different and new evaluations of the players. You know, they are they we're finding out that some players are really good at things that we didn't know about earlier because of these new statistics. You know, batting with three with two strikes on you uh, in the seventh inning with bases loaded, somebody could be uh, have a huge percentage, uh, huge batting average there we didn't know about before, but we do it now. So anyway, it's opening up new new um, avenues of thought, and it leads to innovation, even more innovation. Yeah, and you yeah we have to be and one I'll just add one last thought we have to be careful though of where you draw the line with automation and using data and, and not taking the human element out of the game. I actually asked, uh, I met Raleigh Fingers at uh, one of the events, uh, the Oakland A's Hall of Fame relief pitcher. And I asked him his opinion of technology and sports. And he said he loves technology and sports uh, because you can, if you're a pitcher and you can go back in the dugout and watch yourself on replay, you might notice something in your mechanics that needs to be changed or something like that. But he did say, leave the umpires alone. So he's not a big fan of automated balls and strikes. He goes, it's a human game. Some umpires make mistakes. Players make mistakes. That's yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, don't totally get rid of the human element. Right. Okay. So as you said, though, the one salient point was everything is data. And so for topic two, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, Amazon Web Services and uh, their connect contacts in a product. And actually, uh, the week before I went to the All-Star game, I went to Las Vegas so I am traveling again. So the world's kind of opening back up here. And I spoke at the uh, con uh, Customer Contact Week event, and I interviewed three AWS customers. And what's what's interesting about AWS Connect is that's your contact center product. And a lot of people have questioned whether Amazon can be successful in the contact center. And so that product actually evolved from their own contact center. So Amazon's kind of renowned for great customer service. You pick up the phone, you always get somebody on the phone. There's never any hold time. Uh, they have 70,000 contact center agents. They took that technology and they made a customer, fa customer facing. And uh, they brought a bit of a, I think they have a real opportunity to be a, a real disruptor in this market, Chris. And they've taken a bit of a different approach to the market. Everybody else in the contact center space does the traditional per seat, uh, per user, uh, or per user per month pricing, which is very common SaaS applications, right? Salesforce does that, Microsoft does that. Everything, almost everything you buy, is based on per user per seat. Now, the problem that becomes for seasonal businesses is that you have to buy for peak. So if you're a retailer, you buy for the number of contact center agents you need between Thanksgiving and Christmas, but you don't need that many people for the rest of the year. So you wind up overpaying for most of the year. Amazon's approach is more utilization based. So you can provision a thousand contact center agents. And if you only do 10,000 calls one month, you pay for 10,000 calls. If you do 100,000 the next month, you pay for 100,000. <clears> and that was no more, um, was that the, the best use case for that I saw was came from Becky Plager, who talked about the use of it at Hilton Hotels. So if you think about industries that were upset during the pandemic, uh, clearly travel was one of them. And she told me that, um, you know, they were rolling along, the pandemic started, they started offering free cancellation, their calls went through the roof, right? Then, of course, the pandemic ended, or I mean, uh, the, the, the free cancellation period, everybody canceled. Then their calls went to nothing because nobody was traveling. And she said, had she had to do the traditional model 
of per user per month, they would have been overpaying 10, 20 X perhaps. Uh, but the fact that they were utilization based allowed her to scale up, scale down, you know, as they come out of the pandemic, you know, scale up again and, and truly just pay for what you use. So I think that's uh, uh, kind of an interesting disruptive factor of what they're doing. Another interesting use case came from the state of Maryland. And by the way, there's more detail on these case studies coming on a ZDNet post that uh, should be up by the time we post this um, uh, post this video. <clears throat> the state of Maryland was fascinating too because they use Amazon Connect for contact tracing. Now, I didn't think about how difficult the task this was un until I was talking to Lance Shine, the person who runs um, the, the contact center. Then he was tasked with the process of standing up a contact center aid for uh, for uh, 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 for contact tracing. So that would have been about a thousand people uh, that have never worked in a contact center before that are all working from home, right? And he had to stand that up in a couple of weeks because if it took longer than that, you know, obviously that's going to create an escalation in, in, in COVID and people are going to die. <clears throat> and so because uh, Connect is all cloud-based, it's built off the Amazon backend, he was very quickly able to get it up and running. And sort of in full disclosure, my son actually did contact tracing for the state of Massachusetts, and they used the Connect product uh, there as well. But he, and I asked him about it. He said the training uh, was very, very easy. You know, the front end is very simple, um, and the product worked pretty well. The third case, and it was a different use case here, Traeger Grills. Um, they make pellet grills. Uh, Brian Taggart, the, the person who runs a contact center there, said they started using a lot of the AI features that were built into Connect. And so uh, you, you can almost think of that as having an expert along with the agent in which they can whisper in your ear and tell you things to say or do screen pops and things like that. So, you know, again, uh, I, I get a lot of questions about whether Amazon's serious about this market or not. And I think um, for all uh, the questions about them in the market, I think they have the opportunity to be this biggest disruptor in the market. And frankly, if Amazon wants a market, I don't see the why they can't be successful. But this is one they've done a nice job of. They brought a different approach to this market. And, um, you know, obviously, nobody does more with data than Amazon, right, which ties us back to the first story. Um, and I think here's a here's a case where, um, you know, they're just, they're just bringing a lot of excellence to it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Amazon has long been a leader in this. They were one of the first movers. They basically invented the modern cloud with S3 back in 2006. And they've continued to innovate, and um, they are a leader here. There's no question about it. That's why they own the market. So yeah, yeah. People, yeah. Amazon customers like them. One of the fascinating things I, I find about Amazon too is uh, um, they have a lot of programs in place to help customers optimize the Amazon spend. And so you would think that's counterintuitive. What vendor helps you spend less with them? But by doing that, people tend to spend more with them. <laughs> All uh, right. So they, they have a, you know, Microsoft can learn a lot from that. I know the, I've talked to some Azure customers where that's not the case. And there's a whole cottage industry created around that. But uh, this is a case where, you know, Am the work Amazon does in helping us customers right size and spend actually provides them a lot of dividends down the back end. And uh, so uh, last topic here, Chris, I know you recently wrote a post um, on, uh, on ZDNet about uh, website builders, right? And some of the top 10 uh, products used there, and then there was some of the results surprised me a little bit. Yeah, as this, uh, this past week, I published uh, a study on uh, the best free, what we think are the best free, uh, freely available website builders. And there's some uh, familiar names there, but there are a couple of new ones too. The one uh, we used about probably seven or eight different resources on the web uh, to come up with this list. Uh, Wix, W I X, came up on top of the list with the, with the best ratings across the board as far as usability, features, storage, and support, et cetera. Uh, and then, of course, each of these free websites has a paid version uh, above it that you can pay a little money and per month and get more features and more support. Uh, WordPress came up number two, um, although it's very close, and they're Wix and... and, and um, uh, WordPress are very different because WordPress is really for more for professionals and for, for doing business type sites or publishing sites, um, you know, like, like ZDNet and uh, eWeek and others. Um, and it's very reliable, very intuitive, easy to use, generally speaking, and forgiving. If you make a mistake, um, it'll tell you and you can 
uh, fix it right away. Uh, some of the others on the list include a, a one called Site123, which is very simple, uh, generally uh, for one person businesses or, or personal websites, very easy to, to use. And uh, some of the others, Simple Site, Weebly, and Jimdo, J-I-M-D-O, which is a European-based uh, uh, web builder. And uh, those are all highly rated uh, according to our resources. So go to ZDNet and uh, plug in best website builders. You can come up with the story with detail. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks for that, Chris. And uh, I, I noticed we're buttoned up sort of against the clock here. So uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I want to thank everybody for joining me for this episode of Zcast. Chris, I'll see you next week. And um, have a good rest of your evening. Take care.